John Wilkes Booth thought he was doing such a wonderful thing, uh, but truth is he hurt the South just as much as he hurt the North and he hurt the entire country uh, in the process. But when we look at American slavery, there are two things about it that, that they certainly didn't teach us in school. Uh, a lot of things they didn't teach us in school. Did the Romans have slaves? Yes. Did the Greeks have slaves? Two, two of the greatest civilizations ever. They had slaves. Did the Phoenicians have slaves? Yes. Did the English Empire have slaves? Yes. But in the United States, slavery was unique because the slavery went to the child, the grandchild, the great-grandchild. In every other culture where slavery existed, it ended with the person. The second thing that we weren't taught, and there's many things, but the second thing that really stands out in my mind that we weren't taught about slavery was its indispensable role in helping the 13 colonies to become a nation. Uh, when I did my history on Atlantic City, it, it was pretty evident to me early on that the freed slaves who came from the South and worked in Atlantic City, they were indispensable to creating Atlantic City. 95% of the hotel workforce from around 1890 to 1930, you could even say 1880 to 1940, but I'll give you, give you that 45, 50 year period. 95% of the hotel workforce was African American. If you remove them from Atlantic City's history, the town does not come to be. I don't know what it is, but it's something different. The same thing was true of the 13 colonies. Let's say that you're in Savannah, uh, you're in Boston, I'm in Philadelphia. Why Philadelphia? Philadelphia was the home of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was our nation's first international celebrity. Everybody knew who he was. He was an amazing guy. And so when he, he didn't conceive of the Continental Congress, but when he agreed that the Continental Congress was a good thing, Philadelphia is where, the, is where this was going to happen. We had a very long period of time because of the death of Abraham Lincoln where this nation never really got forward, never really went forward in, in, terms, of, in terms of dealing with all of, all of the problems that were, that, that were spawned through the slavery experience. And when I look back over it, it was, it was such, a, such a pieces, and I call them cornerstones, that came together that really created problems that still live with us today. The first was the refusal of Congress to fund the Freedmen's Bureau. The second was the failure of both Congress and all of the presidents to enforce the 14th and the 15th Amendment. Uh, the third were rulings by the Supreme Court that sort of made, made, made discrimination and, and, and made separation uh, legal and sort of put them into concrete. Uh, everybody remember this decision, Plessy versus Ferguson? Separate but equal. Separate but equal. And that was the law for a very long time. And then the fourth thing, which is, was so prevalent that you don't think about it, but it had its effect, was popular ent entertainment. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Thomas Daddy Rice, who was the, who, he wrote the song Jim Crow, and he was the first performer back in the 1830s, even before the Civil War, to perform on New York stage in blackface, imi Im imitating uh, a, basically a buffoon. And that became the standard for how black people were portrayed on the stage, in films, and that went on for a very, very long time. I said to him, can you explain to me what happened on the north side? It was such a vibrant community with so many businesses, and now it's like this burned out place. Here's his response. Segregation was planned real well. Integration wasn't planned at all. Atlantic City is a town dedicated to the fast buck. It has been, it always will be. Uh, and I, and that's, but I don't say that disparagingly because let's face it, most resorts are dedicated to the fast buck uh, because most resorts have this window uh, where they can earn their living and, and the window closes and everybody moves on. Uh, but Barry mentioned it, and, and, and I agree totally. Atlantic City is unique, and it's also unique in American history in this regard. It was, at the time, and remains today, an experiment 
in urban planning. It was the first community in the United States founded for a singular purpose, and that was to be a resort. Now, there were some resorts like Cape May uh, and Saratoga that are older, and, and, and even, even Long Branch, uh, that are older and, and, and pre, pre-existed Atlantic City as resorts, but they weren't founded to be a resort. They were founded for other things, and they evolved into resorts. Atlantic City was founded to be a resort, had no other reason to exist. And Canada Lee still has no other reason to exist. But in order for a resort to be successful, and th- these are my three, my three made up rules, so to speak, uh, there, are, there are three things that a resort, any resort, has to do. Uh, the first, and I think you'll all agree with me on this, a visitor must leave happy. If the visitor doesn't leave happy, they're not coming back, and, you're, and, you're, and your base is going to shrivel. Now, my very unscientific, and, and sometimes this annoys the hell out of my wife, because I'll stop and talk to complete strangers anywhere. Uh, my very unscientific uh, poll is that people, by and large, are happy in Atlantic City, happy with the product that they get. And I think, though, and, and I think this is more, it's a more a factor of how well the casino hotel properties treat their people that brings people back than it is, and we'll talk about this in a moment, than it is the city itself. The city's got a, got, a, got a certain history to it, and the city's got a certain feel to it, but I think what makes people come back, whether they go to the, you know, the Tropicana or, or resorts or, or Borgata, I think they're coming back because of how well they're treated at the properties. That's not a small thing. That's a very good thing. So I think Atlantic City passes that first test. The second thing is that I was really, when I say uh, heartened, I, 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 get, I get up very early, and, and fortunately my newspaper gets delivered very early. And I think it was yesterday morning, it was yesterday morning where the press did a front page article on uh, their interview with the principals in the Hard Rock uh, Casino. They had glowing things, because the the second requirement for a successful resort is is good employees. Because, look, first time around, Atlantic City, from 1880 to 1930, that 50-year period, and, and there's probably shoulders on that too. But looking at the, the censuses that I looked at, that 50-year period, Atlantic City was basically a plantation. It, it, 95% of the hotel workforce was African American. Management was white. I mean, I can show you photo after photo of either all black hotel staff or one white person or two white people persons, and then maybe 50 or 100 black employees. So, so Atlantic City had very good staff first time around, and if you listen to the, to the, to the people that I've spoken to and the people that you can read about, uh, the casino industry by and large feels quite comfortable with the, with the hotel staff that they have. Uh, there are a lot of good people available, and they make their operations run successfully. But the third requirement for a resort is where we run into a problem. And you've probably all heard the saying, uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. Well, where there is no vision for a resort, there's a big problem. Because resorts constantly must adapt. They constantly must evolve and change with society's tastes and society's desires. And you typically expect that vision to come from the powers that be, so to speak, but that's not going to happen in Atlantic City. I don't see that happening uh, anytime soon uh, at all. This was a guy who basically created uh, the judiciary's right to write the court rules simply because he imagined that we should have it that way. Uh, and he contradicted himself. We talked about Lincoln this morning in another class, how Lincoln had contradicted himself over time. Well, Vanderbilt contradicted himself totally, in terms of letters that he had written and promises that he had made. He did a 180 because it was the right thing to do for the court in its infancy. So we're going we're to talk a lot about Arthur Vanderbilt. You were either attracted to him or you were repelled by him. Uh, he was a very, nothing warm and fuzzy about, about Arthur Vanderbilt. Uh, but this photo is when he's a student at Wesleyan. Uh, when he graduated, he had enough credits for his master's degree. 
And so the next year, he goes on to uh, Columbia Law School. He works on his master's thesis in his freshman year in law school. And in the evenings, three nights a week, he is teaching English and other subjects to immigrants in a, in a Newark high school. His law practice was truly a national and international law practice. He primarily specialized in, de in defense work. Uh, he created the ABA def uh, defense section uh, for lawyers sometime back in the 30s. Uh, and he had an amazing law practice. I had the chance to go through. He, he, this was a person who knew he was destined for greatness. And he had the wisdom and the foresight to really favor somebody like me. He s saved everything. He saved stuff from his college days right on up until the time he died. And all of that is at Wesleyan University. It's over 200 boxes. I probably went through about 40 of them. Uh, pretty good, his, his grandson did a pretty good job of creating a catalog. So you know, you know what you're looking for when you start hunting through it. But uh, when I went through his files on his law practice, he had a name of a client for almost every letter in the alphabet. There was a couple letters that he didn't have, but it was an amazing. And he had clients in about 30 of the 48 states. He had clients in England, France, Japan, South America. He, he, was, he was an extraordinary advocate. There was about a 20-year period and for, that was Haig, and for about a 15-year period, and that was Vanderbilt, if you wanted to run for statewide office as a Republican, you needed Arthur Vanderbilt's endorsement. And if you didn't get it, you weren't, you weren't gonna run. And the same thing was true with, with Frank Haig for about a 20, maybe 21-year period. Uh, if you wanted to be uh, a statewide candidate, Haig had to endorse you. Those two obviously eventually clashed. Haig really did view politics in New Jersey as a religious war. Uh, when he came, when his parents came and, and when his generation came up in Jersey City, uh, they were segregated into a section of the city called the Horseshoe. You may have heard that term before, but the voting district that most of the Irish were shoved into what looked like a horseshoe, and they were jammed in there. And why were they jammed in there? Because it would ensure that they could elect no more than two aldermen, and the other eight, even though they had a majority of the population, the other eight would be elected by wasps. Vanderbilt co-wrote the book, and the boss, the Hague machine in action, was really a character assassination. It, it, was, it was anything but a straight up history. Eventually, if, if they're about my third or fourth trip to Wesleyan, I found this file, and then all, everything came together, and then I, I, have, I got a completely different book on my hands, because I no longer have this, you know, this fair-haired boy who's, you know, trying to reform government. I got a real backstabber on my hands. I view Arthur Vanderbilt, two of my favorite philosophers are Machiavelli and St. Augustine. And Arthur Vanderbilt really is a combination of the, of, of, of the two of them. <laughs>